Section three of De Vulgari Eloquentia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary J. De Vulgari Eloquentia by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Philip H. Wicksteed. Book one, chapters nine through thirteen. Chapter nine. We must now put whatever reason we possess to the proof, since it is our purpose to investigate matters in which we are supported by the authority of none, namely, the change which has passed over a language which was originally of one and the same form. And because it is safer as well as quicker to travel by known paths, let us proceed with that language alone which belongs to us, neglecting the others. For that which we find in one appears by analogy to exist in the others also. The language, then, which we are proceeding to treat of is threefold, as has been mentioned above. For some of those who speak it say oc, others si, and others we, and that this language was uniform at the beginning of the confusion, which must first be proved, appears from the fact that we agree in many words, as eloquent writers show, which agreement is repugnant to that confusion which expiated the crime committed in the building of Babel. The writers of all three forms of the language agree, then, in many words, especially in the word amor. Girard de Bonnel says, Sim sentis fezels amix per ver en cusera amor, the king of Navarre, de fin amor se vient sain et bonté. Messer Guido Guinizelli, ne fa amor prima che gentil corre, ne gentil cor prima che amor natura. Let us now inquire why it is that this language has varied into three chief forms, and why each of these variations varies in itself. Why, for instance, the speech of the right side of Italy varies from that of the left, for the Paduans speak in one way and the Pisans in another, and also why those who live nearer together still vary in their speech, as the Milanese and the Veronese, the Romans and the Florentines, and even those who have the same national designation, as the Neapolitans and the people of Gaeta, those of Ravenna and those of Faenza, and what is stranger still, the inhabitants of the same city, like the Bolognese of the Borgo San Felice and the Bolognese of the Strada Maggiore. One and the same reason will explain why all these differences and varieties of speech occur. We say, therefore, that no effect as such goes beyond its cause, because nothing can bring about that which itself is not, since therefore every language of ours, except that created by God with the first man, has been restored at our pleasure after the confusion, which was nothing else but forgetfulness of the former language, and since man is a most unstable and changeable animal, no human language can be lasting and continuous, but must needs vary like other properties of ours, as, for instance, our manners and our dress, according to distance of time and place. And so far am I from thinking that there is room for doubt as to the truth of our remark that speech varies according to the difference of time, that we are of opinion that this is rather to be held as certain. For, if we consider our other actions, we seem to differ much more from our fellow countrymen in the very distant times than from our contemporaries very remote in place. Wherefore we boldly affirm that if the ancient Pavians were to rise from the dead, they would talk in a language varying or differing from that of the modern Pavians. Nor should what we are saying appear more wonderful than to observe that a young man is grown up whom we have not seen growing, for the motion of those things which move gradually is not considered by us at all, and the longer the time required for perceiving the variation of a thing, the more stable we suppose that thing to be. Let us not therefore be surprised if the opinions of men who are but little removed from the brutes suppose that citizens of the same town have always carried on their intercourse with an unchangeable speech, because the change in the speech of the same town comes about gradually not without a very long succession of time, whilst the life of a man is in its nature extremely short. If, therefore, the speech of the same people varies, as has been said, successively in the course of time, and cannot in any wise stand still, the speech of people living apart and removed from one another must needs vary in different ways, just as manners and dress vary in different ways, since they are not rendered stable either by nature or by intercourse, but arise according to men's inclinations and local fitness. Hence were set in motion the inventors of the art of grammar, which is nothing else but a kind of unchangeable identity of speech in different times and places. This, having been settled by the common consent of many peoples, seems exposed to the arbitrary will of none in particular, and consequently cannot be variable. They therefore invented grammar in order that we might not, on account of the variation of speech fluctuating at the will of individuals, either fail altogether in attaining, or at least attain but a partial knowledge of the opinions and exploits of the ancients or of those whom difference of place causes to differ from us. Chapter 10 Our language, being now spoken under three forms, as has been said above, we feel, when comparing it with itself, according to the three forms that it has assumed, such great hesitation and timidity in placing its different forms in the balances, that we dare not, in our comparison, 
give the preference to any one of them, except in so far as we find that the founders of grammar have taken seek as the adverb of affirmation, which seems to confer a kind of precedence on the Italians, who say si. For each of the three divisions of our language defends its pretensions by copious evidence. That of we, then, alleges on its behalf that because of its being an easier and pleasanter vernacular language, whatever has been translated into or composed in vernacular prose belongs to it, namely, the compilations of the exploits of the Trojans and Romans, the exquisite legends of King Arthur, and very many other works of history and learning. Another, namely that of Oc, claims that eloquent speakers of the vernacular first employed it for poetry, as being a more finished and sweeter language, for instance, Peter of Alvernia and other ancient writers. The third also, which is the language of the Italians, claims preeminence on the strength of two privileges. First, that the sweetest and most subtle poets who have written in the vernacular are its intimate friends and belong to its household, like Cino of Pistoia and his friend. Second, that it seems to lean more on grammar, which is common. In this appears a very weighty argument to those who examine the matter in a rational way. We, however, decline to give judgment in this case, and confining our treatise to the vernacular Italian, let us endeavor to enumerate the variations it has received into itself, and also to compare these with one another. In the first place, then, we say that Italy has a twofold division into right and left, but if any should ask what is the dividing line, we answer shortly that it is the ridge of the Apennines, which, like the ridge of a tiled roof, discharges its droppings in different directions on either side, and pours its waters down to either shore, alternately, through long gutter tiles, as Lucan describes in his second book. Now the right side has the Tyrrhenian Sea as its basin, while the waters of the left fall into the Adriatic. The districts on the right are Apulia, but not the whole of it, the Duchy of Spoleto, Tuscany, and the March of Genoa. Those on the left are part of Apulia, the March of Ancona, Romagna, Lombardy, and the March of Treviso with Venezia. Friuli and Istria cannot but belong to the left of Italy, and the islands of the Tyrian Sea, namely Sicily and Sardinia, must belong to or be associated with the right of Italy. Now in each of these two sides, and those districts which follow them, the languages of the inhabitants vary, as for instance the language of the Sicilians as compared with that of the Apulians, of the Apulians with that of the Romans, of the Romans with that of the Spoletans, of these with that of the Tuscans, of the Tuscans with that of the Genoese, of the Genoese with that of the Sardinians, also of the Calabrians with that of the people of Ancona, of these with that of the people of Romagna, of the people of Romagna with that of the Lombards, of the Lombards with that of the Trevisans and the Venetians, and of these last with that of the Aquileans, and of them with that of the Istrians. And we do not think that any Italian will disagree with us in this statement. Whence it appears that Italy alone is diversified by fourteen dialects at least, all of which, again, vary in themselves, as, for instance, in Tuscany the Sienese differ in speech from the Aretines, in Lombardy the Ferrarese from the Placentines. In the same city, also, we observe some variation, as we remarked above in the last chapter. Wherefore, if we would calculate the primary, secondary, and subordinate variations of the vulgar tongue of Italy, we should find that in this tiny corner of the world the varieties of speech not only come up to a thousand, but even exceed that figure. CHAPTER Eleven. As the Italian vernacular has so many discordant varieties, let us hunt after a more fitting and an illustrious Italian language. And in order that we may also be able to have a practicable path for our chase, let us first cast the tangled bushes and brambles out of the wood. Therefore, as the Romans think that they ought to have precedence over all the rest, let us in this process of uprooting or clearing away give them, not undeservedly, precedence, declaring that we will have nothing to do with them in any scheme of a vernacular language. We say, then, that the vulgar tongue of the Romans, or rather their hideous jargon, is the ugliest of all the Italian dialects. Nor is this surprising, since in the depravity of their manners and customs also they appear to stink worse than all the rest. For they say, Mezzure quinto dici. After them, let us get rid of the inhabitants of the March of Ancona, who say, Cignamente scate sciate, with whom we reject the Spoletans also. Nor must we forget that a great many canzoni have been written in contempt of these three peoples, among which we have noticed one correctly and perfectly constructed, which a certain Florentine named Castra had composed. It began, Una fermana scopai da cascioli, cita cita sen gian grande aina. And after these let us weed out the people of Milan and Bergamo with their neighbors, in reproach of whom we recollect that someone has sung, Enti l'ora del vesper, ciò fu del mes d'occhiover. After them, let us sift out the Aquileans and Istrians, who belch forth with cruelly harsh accents, Cos fastu? And with these we cast out all the mountainous and rural dialects, as those of Casentino and Prato, which by the extravagance of their accent always seems discordant to the citizens dwelling in the midst of the towns. 
let us also cast out the sardinians who are not italians but are it seems to be associated with them since they alone seem to be without any vulgar tongue of their own imitating latin as apes do men for they say domus nova and dominus meus chapter twelve having sifted so to speak the italian vernaculars let us comparing together those left in our sieve briefly choose out one of the most honourable and conferring the most honour and first let us examine the genius of the sicilian for the sicilian vernacular appears to arrogate to itself a greater renown than the others both because whatever poetry the italians write is called sicilian and because we find that very many natives of sicily have written weighty poetry as in the canzoni ancor che laigua per lo foco lassi and amor che lungiamente mai menato but this fame of the land of trinacria appears if we rightly examine the mark to which it tends only to have survived by way of a reproach to the princes of italy who not in a heroic but in a plebeian manner follow pride but those illustrious heroes frederick caesar and his happy-born son manfred displaying the nobility and righteousness of their character as long as fortune remained favourable followed what is human disdaining what is bestial wherefore those who were of noble heart and endowed with graces strove to attach themselves to the majesty of such great princes so that in their time whatever the best italians attempted first appeared at the court of these mighty sovereigns and from the fact that the royal throne was sicily it came to pass that whatever our predecessors wrote in the vulgar tongue was called sicilian in this name we also retain nor will our successors be able to change it raca raca what is the sound now uttered by the trumpet of the latest frederick what is that uttered by the bell of charles the second what is that uttered by the horns of the powerful marquis john and azzo what is that uttered by the flutes of the other magnates what but come ye murderers come ye traitors come ye followers of avarice but it is better to return to our subject than to speak in vain and we declare that if we take the sicilian dialect that namely spoken by the common people out of whose mouths it appears our judgment should be drawn it is in no wise worthy of preference because it is not uttered without drawlings as for instance here tragemi deste focora se teste a voluntate if however we choose to take the language as it flows from the mouths of the highest sicilians as it may be examined in the canzoni quoted before it differs in nothing from that language which is the most worthy of praise as we show further on the apulians also because of their own harshness of speech or else because of their nearness to their neighbours who are the romans and the people of the march of ancona make use of shameful barbarisms for they say volzere che chianiesse lo quattraro but though the natives of apulia commonly speak in a hideous manner some of them have been distinguished by their use of polished language inserting more curial words into their canzoni as clearly appears from an examination of their works for instance madonna dir vi voglio and perfino amore vossi letamente wherefore it should become clear to those who mark what has been said above that neither the sicilian nor the apulian dialect is that vulgar tongue which is the most beautiful in italy for we have shown that eloquent natives of those parts have diverged from their own dialect chapter thirteen next let us come to the tuscans who infatuated through their frenzy seem to arrogate to themselves the title of the illustrious vernacular and in this matter not only the minds of the common people are crazed but we find that many distinguished men have embraced the delusion for instance guitone varezzo who never aimed at the curial vernacular bonagiunta of lucca gallo of pisa mino moccato of siena and brunetto of florence whose works if there be leisure to examine them will be found to be not curial but merely municipal and since the tuscans exceed the rest in this frenzied intoxication it seems right and profitable to deal with the dialects of the tuscan towns one by one and to take off somewhat of their vainglory the florentines open their mouths and say manichiamo in troque noi non facciano altro the pisans bene andono li fanti de fiorenza per pisa the people of lucca fo voto a dio che ingassara cielo comuno de lucca the sienese onche renegata avesse io siena che che esto the aretines votu venire ovele we do not intend to deal with perugia orvieto and the citta castellana at all because of their close connection with the romans and spoletans but obtuse as almost all the tuscans are in their degraded dialect we notice that some have recognized wherein the excellence of the vernacular consists namely guido lapo and another all florentines and chino of pistoia whom we now undeservedly put last having been not undeservedly driven to do so therefore if we examine the tuscan dialects reflecting how the writers commended above have deviated from their own dialect it does not remain doubtful that the vernacular we are in search of is different from that which the people of tuscany attain to but if any one thinks that what we say of the tuscans may not also be said of the genoese let him but bear this in mind that if the genoese were through forgetfulness to lose the letter z 
they would have either to be dumb altogether or to discover some new kind of speech for z forms the greatest part of their dialect and this letter is not uttered without great harshness end of section three